Classic car pricing used to be sorcery, where dealers, appraisers, and auction houses held the cards. Appraisers that used to be a critical resource in the hobby are going the way of buggy whip makers. The internet provides what's known as data democratization. And that's easy access to prior sales, online communities that are knowledgeable on various marks, and data tools that make it easy for everyday enthusiasts to price their cars. I'm Rudy Samsell, the co-founder of guyswithrides.com. And in this video, I'm going to take you through how to price your collector car accurately and with knowledge. First of all, you have to be realistic about your classic car's condition. It's human nature for most enthusiasts to really uh, play on the strengths of their car. And classic car conditions for a given make and model generally fall into a, a normal distribution or what's known as the bell curve. Very, very few will be in the top tier or that number, what we call the number one concord. I'll get into conditions in a minute, but very few fall into that ultimate category. A few more fall into the, what's known as the excellent category or condition two. And generally, most classic cars fall into this number three good category. On the other side of the curve, you get into uh, daily driver condition kind of cars. Uh, they're still runnable and, and, and roadworthy. Uh, and then finally, at the other end of it, are condition five junk cars. We'll get back to that in a moment. But you have to be realistic about the condition of your car. Another important rule is what you have in your ride is not what it's worth. We run into this time and time again where we'll get a request for a, a valuation and somebody says, well, I have $20,000 into the car, so I want to sell it for $25,000 when in fact the car might only be worth 15,000 with very few exceptions these days. Chances are good. The money you've put into restoring a car is not what you're going to get out of it. Another thing we run into is somebody will say to us, I saw my car or you'll see this in Craigslist ads a lot. Uh, a similar car to mine went for X on this TV auction or on bring a trailer and that's what my price is going to be. That's a foolish way of keeping your car unsold for a long time. Let's talk about how to rate your car's condition and what is the generally accepted uh, conditions that you need to be realistic about. I'm going to take you through the various conditions using a 65 mu Mustang convertible as an example. Now in this slide here, I found this number one, what I would consider a number one condition, Wimbledon white over Rangoon red Mustang convertible. Now, first thing you look at is the trim tag. And in this car, the trim tag matches what the car has right now in terms of interior and exterior paint. Nicely done there. The, the, um, the engine code matches. It's a number matching car. You look at the engine, the engine's detailed. And generally what I'm seeing here is a car uh, that probably fits this um, number one condition very well. Paint shiny, everything looks good. I cannot, if, if there are any flaws, you don't see them until you're up close. Moving on to condition two, a number two excellent car. What do you look for there? Well, here's an example of a car, another 65 Mustang convertible, Wimbledon white over Rangoon red. Interesting. However, when you look at the trim tag, this car was originally Rangoon Ren exterior with a different interior. And you notice that the um, engine has a dress up kit, a Cobra uh, dress up kit. This isn't a factory, um, isn't something that would have come from the factory, but generally it's an excellent looking car, very clean, maybe well detailed but not a numbers matching, uh, color changes. That's generally, you're, you're not gonna win a major show. You could win a local show with this car, um, but if you were to take it to a, a Mustang or like say a National Corvette Restoration Society uh, event and CRS, you're not gonna get anything better rating than a number two. As I showed in the bell curve earlier, the vast majority of cars 
uh, fall into the condition three good. And here's an example of a 65 Mustang. Now, it, I hope you can see it here, but there's panel gaps. You can see the rocker panel uh, trim is uh, uh, turned a little bit. Uh, the hood has a little bit of a gap. Look at the, you can see the door gap between the front uh, fender and the uh, driver's door. And of course, the, the, the slotted aluminum uh, wheels there. Uh, this is generally what you might see at a, a local show. And I, I, the vast majority of cars I run into, some people use the term, it's a good 20 footer. And that's a great explanation for it. Uh, car looks good for most casual passers-by, but, but somebody that does this uh, all the time would quickly find those faults. It's a very presentable car, don't get me wrong, but you just have to be realistic about those expectations. Another thing I look for with a Condition 3 car is, um, is there any rust? And I'm not talking about surface rust underneath the, in the undercarriage generally, but if there's any exposed rust on the bodywork or, or structural rust underneath, that automatically, in my mind, pushes the car down to a condition four. I might, you know, some cars, if it's a good survivor uh, that has some maybe like lower rucker panel rust or low mileage survivor, I might push that up to like a three and a half kind of rating. But generally, that's how I look at the cars. A condition four car is what we generally called fair or daily driver. Uh, these are cars that are roadworthy. Uh, can be used, um, but generally probably do not. Uh, a casual non-collector car enthusiast would walk by and say, well, the car's seen better days. Probably has some visible rust showing. The interior's tattered. Uh, just generally needs work on everything to make it um, get up to a Condition 3 car. Finally, you have what's known as the Condition 5 um, salvage or extreme project car. First of all, it's not drivable, probably has missing pieces such as this convertible here, and um, more than likely has structural rust, and that's why it was parked in the first place. I, I tend to believe the bell curve fits for classic car conditions, and unless it's a very special, uh, well-restored or low-mileage original, your car is probably going to fall in that number three good category. If you're planning to auction your car, be it online or a traditional in-person venue. One of the things you have to be aware of is sell-through. That is an auctions measure of how many cars they sold versus how many they offered. Now, sell-through also applies to, to many online auction houses, and they're motivated to try and convince sellers to either agree to no reserve or a very low reserve price. Mm -hmm. You need to be smart about what your car is really worth. So the data sources we use for pricing. There are three key ones that we use. Classic.com, the Collector Car Market Review, or CCM, and the Haggerty Insurance Valuation Tool. I used to rely a fair amount on the NADA guides. Unfortunately, with some of the consolidation going on in the industry, uh, they were swallowed up by J.D. Power. And if you've been on the J.D. Power website in the last three months, it's a train wreck. And I'm not afraid to say that. So the two I rely on that provide values based on car's condition are CCM and Haggerty. So Haggerty's methodology. And some of this you have to take with a grain of salt. So Haggerty relies on three key sources. The vast majority, 70% by their own admission is by private party sales that that they say is from their insurance data one of the things you have to take with a grain of salt is i'm assuming that all of that data is self-reported so a customer calls up and says i just bought this car or i just sold this car that you insured for me and the question invariably comes up well what did you end up getting for the car and so they're relying on the seller and or the buyer to reflect on what was what was the sell price or the uh, bought price. Now, if you think about that for a minute, Haggerty's in the business of insurance. So if you're calling Haggerty um, to insure a car, chances are good you're going to try to bump up the value to cover 
yourself in case there's, God forbid, there's a loss on the car or something like that. Now, on the flip side, um, you know, anytime there's, as a, as a former data analyst, anytime you're relying on self-reported data, you have to take that with a grain of salt. It's just human nature for people to over-report um, on, on, on sales they've had. All right, so that nuance aside, they then rely about 20% of their valuations are based on auction data that they compile. And another 10% is dealer sales or what I would call retail sales. That's their mix. And they aggregate that all up. They have a very good team of, of analysts who aggregate that up. And uh, it's a tool that I'll show that works very easily. I'll demonstrate that in a little bit here. Collect your car marketplace, another good source. Um, now, when you look up their um, methodology, they, they say they rely on an unspecified combination of empirical data from a variety of sources. There is no time span to the data, so you don't know whether the value shown are one year, five year, or not, and you can't, you can't break it up like you can on Haggerty or um, Classic that I'll get into. The, the good data, their, their good data, only goes up to model year 1983. Now, I've noticed in the past six months or so, they've added data on past that. Uh, however, it's very limited, um, and I tend to, if I can avoid using it, I will. Um, it it's, tends to get a little kludgy for anything newer than 1983. However, uh, what, I, what I do find is, however they're doing this with their methodology, their values, for the most part, tend to be spot on. I've noticed with a couple ones, and one example in particular was a Ford Bronco. Um, their data for the longest time was lagging behind what was happening in the marketplace. So if, if something has spiked or changed in the last six months, um, the CCM's methodology tends to lag a little bit. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. Again, using a variety of data sources to triangulate and come up with a, a value. But when you look at pricing by condition summaries from Haggerty and CCM, um, when you try to break it out, you'll see big differences. Like this one here, this, um, here's a summary of a, what I'm gonna show you in a little bit. So you can see Haggerty's values, and I took a 65 Mustang convertible, 289 V8 automatic. Haggerty's values, adjusting for those factors, I think, you know, depending on, um, and, and Haggerty has their percentages you can adjust up or down, as well as CCM has theirs. But you can see Haggerty's ranges from 73,000 to 20,700. Uh, while Collector Car Marketplace goes from 55,000 to just under 17,000. So, you know, there's those nuances again, uh, particularly with Haggerty on the upper side. Th these are the tough conversations I have when I show people. Well, I, I saw it was, I saw a Mustang went for 73, Haggerty saying a number one is 73,000. Yeah, probably going to be very difficult to get that number. And you have to be much more realistic uh, about that. One of these three, the one I love the best right now is classic.com. Um, looked online at uh, Zillow or other home buying sites where um, you're able to look at homes in a neighborhood and see what they've actually sold for. That's Classics MO. They, um, a relatively new company, and they started out with just reporting auction data. Our data actually uh, goes into that mix, but they've been uh, quickly adding on a variety of dealers and other sources to really give a good mix. And the beauty of it is, not only do they give you a good summary, but you're able to look at individual data points and actually click through to the cars. And this is a great tool. If, if let's say you have a 65 Mustang with, uh, that's been, you know, it's been restored and it's a certain color combination with certain options. Generally, you can go in here, click the dots and actually go through and make an assessment of how close your car looks to the other ones. And then from there, 
decide what the best price is. All right, we're waiting for it. Here we go. And I'm going to Haggerty here. This is Haggerty.com, their valuation tools. This is the home site currently. And you just type in the car you're looking for. And I, I'm just putting in 65 Ford Mustang. And when you do that, these are selections. So I'm going to scroll down and pick the base convertible with the 289. You have a photographic memory, and you remember the table I just showed about a minute ago. You'll note that the values shown here uh, don't line up with that table. And the reason is, in the lower right corner, you see this black rectangle, and the, it's right under that it says value adjustments. There it is. Value adjustments minus 10% for automatic and plus 6% for AC. So in the table I showed you, I deducted 10%, assuming the car didn't have AC. So now if I go to collect your car market online, and you'll come to this home page and you pick values picking the mustang here and so here's how they list their data and unfortunately it's somewhat ad intensive uh, but they list it by body style and they're assuming that it's the standard uh, 200 horsepower v8 and they list all the adductions or all the uh, uh, adjustments. So on the left hand side is typically what you need to add, and the right hand side what you need to deduct. So as you can imagine on this car, um, I actually added in 20% for the uh, 225 horsepower V8, and um, there was no hit for automatic transmission on this. So that's where the values I showed you in the table are adjusted plus 20% on the collector car market one. So again, widespread, but at least it gets you a smarter realm of where where uh, people are. If you reach out to a various auction company and they come back with a number, you can kind of tell based on the pictures you provided them where they're coming in with their value and what they think the car is going to sell for. So knowing these data sources are available and what, to, what pitfalls to avoid, hopefully you can go ahead and uh, come up with your own assessment of the car uh, before you either decide to sell the car on your own or use a service such as Guys With Rides. Now, if you're not very computer savvy, want some help with this, Guys With Rides offers complimentary, no commitment uh, market valuations uh, for people that are interested. So if you haven't checked it out yet, I encourage you to visit guyswithrides.com. This is the homepage, and you can see we have Current auctions listed are $5. You know, if auctions aren't for you, you can go to the $5 Guys With Rides class of fines. Our buy now or make offer are, are cars that did not sell at auction, which you can still uh, pick up and make an offer on. And finally, our every other day Craigslist blog, where we uh, talk about cars that we find on Craigslist that are of interest based on our daily theme. Hopefully you found this video informative. If you did, please press the like button and comment and tell us uh, your thoughts on uh, if there's anything we can do or if you're using a different source uh, that we're not aware of. And if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel and visit Guys With Rides. Thank you for watching. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon.